How you start your day makes a huge difference when it comes down to managing your glucose. But if you're trying to make bigger changes, like you're trying to help reduce the risk of maybe insulin resistance, things like that, there are really a few things that you could stack on top of each other to have a tremendous impact. All evidence-based stuff that really is in the peer-reviewed journals that really makes a lot of sense, okay? So let's go ahead and jump into five things that you can do in the morning to manage insulin resistance a bit better. Jumping right into it, the first thing, if you're looking at a plate of breakfast, the order in which you eat your food makes an astronomical difference in terms of what it does to your glucose. And there's science to back this up. There was a study that was published in the journal Diabetes Care. Fascinating research. They took a look at two groups. Okay, these two groups ate the exact same thing, ciabatta bread and orange juice, okay, alongside chicken breast with veggies and butter. Interesting breakfast, but either way, that's what they consumed, okay? Now, with this, they had one group eat the ciabatta bread and orange juice first and then eat the other ingredients. And then the other group ate the chicken first, the protein first, and then ate the carbs and the other ingredients. Well, the group that ate the chicken first, 30 minutes after consumption, they had 28.6% lower glucose than the group that ate the carbs first. 28.6% lower just by eating the protein first. At 60 minutes, it was 36.7% lower in the protein first group. Then after two hours postprandial, it was about 16% lower. Nothing else was different other than the order in which they ate their food. So eating the protein first made such an impact on overall attenuating the blood glucose response. Now, the potential mechanism behind this is probably something to do with what's called glucagon-like peptide one, okay? What this is essentially doing is it is delaying the gastric emptying to a certain degree, but it can also improve beta cell responsiveness. So you're basically getting a double whammy, slow glucose release into the bloodstream plus improved overall pancreatic beta cell function. The next one is a hugely powerful one, and I think we're starting to see more and more and more and more research coming out surrounding the world of fiber. Now, it's not exactly attractive to, I don't know, eat a bunch of asparagus first thing in the morning, so I'm mainly talking about soluble fibers. Make some chia pudding. Make some pancakes with flax meal. Okay, it sounds more complicated than it is. It's not that bad. But anyhow, listen to the research behind it. It's fascinating. There's a study that was published in the journal Nutrition and Metabolism. Took a look at two groups. One group consumed regular bread. Another group consumed bread that was heavily fortified with pea fiber, so it had more of a fiber in it. Well, what they found is that the group that ended up having the fiber bread was definitely more satiated, but they also had a significant improvement in their glucose response throughout the course of the day. Okay, that's no real surprise because what we learned from the protein study before is that, yeah, when you have some fiber, you're probably making like this cake viscousy substance in your gut that is slowing down the absorption of the glucose. That's all fine and dandy, but it goes deeper than that. You see, fiber, specifically things like flax and chia, these soluble fibers, they feed our gut bacteria very well, okay? And what happens then is these gut bacteria feed on the fiber and they produce short-chain fatty acids. These short-chain fatty acids directly impact how we process glucose. There was a study that was published in the journal Science that demonstrated this pretty clear. They found that HbA1c improved quite a bit simply by consuming more fiber. So this study put people on a diet for 12 weeks of 37 grams of fiber versus 16 grams of fiber per day. Nothing crazy, just amounts that it should be versus what we typically get. HbA1c, so the glycolated uh, hemoglobin improved significantly and overall glucose response improved significantly as well. Okay, we're seeing some pretty amazing things. Lots of more data coming out in the world of fiber as well. When I mentioned flax pancakes, there's a company called Noosh Foods that just released some awesome new flax-based pancakes. There's no almond flour in them. There's no regular flour. They're totally gluten-free. They're totally keto-friendly. And they have nothing but squeaky clean ingredients in them. So they have flax as the main. Okay, flax is super high soluble fiber. Really, really, like one of my favorite fibers, if not my favorite fiber. Okay, alongside that, it has coconut flour. It has erythritol and monk fruit as the sweetener sodium bicarbonate, which is just baking soda, then it has organic natural flavors in it, so we're not talking any pesky, mysterious natural flavors, they're using the organic natural flavors, 
They have some egg in it as well, so it has this like natural leavening. It gives it a real cake-like consistency. But they have blueberry flavor, they have chocolate chip, and they have regular old plain. And I'm telling you, these are unlike any other low-carb pancake I have ever had. Plus, you're checking two boxes, okay? You're getting a decent amount of protein because of the egg, okay? But you're also getting the fiber, getting that satiety, but you're also being able to get like that flavor that you would normally want, but you're tackling two birds with one stone at the same time. Okay, getting the fiber, but you're also getting the short chain fatty acid effect from the flax that we like so much. The cool thing about these pancakes is they taste delicious so the whole family can eat them. It tastes better than a real pancake if you ask me. Plus, it's satiating, so the whole family loves them. My kids love them, my son loves them, my daughter loves them, the whole family devours them. And they're something that we all feel comfortable eating and don't feel super guilty about. So use that link and use code THOMAS and you can save 20% off some of these Noosh flax pancakes. Seriously, you will not regret it. So that link is down below with code THOMAS for 20% off. This next one is fascinating because I know if you're watching this video, you might not necessarily be someone that is doing a low carb protocol. Maybe you like your carbohydrates or you just don't feel like you function well without them. That's okay. There is a time to have carbohydrates in the morning, okay? One of the best times, as crazy as it sounds, is literally during your workout. That's right, you're gonna be the guy eating tacos in the bench press, or maybe you're gonna be eating chalupas in the squat rack. You don't have to go that far, but the reality is interesting evidence there. What happens is you have what is called an insulin-independent glucose uptake. When your muscles move, you create what is called, a, um, you create a deficit, basically. So when your muscles move and contract, you phosphorylate AMPK. In human terms, what that means is you create a demand for energy. This demand for energy creates an interesting gradient that actually draws glucose out of the bloodstream and into the muscle cell without insulin being needed. Normally, you eat carbohydrates, your body secretes insulin, and that lets the glucose into the cell. But when you are simultaneously exercising, as well as consuming some carbohydrates, those carbohydrates do not require insulin to get into the cell nearly as much. That doesn't mean that you eat a bowl of rice while on the stationary bike, but it means that you may want to maybe consume a small amount of carbohydrates intra-workout. Maybe you have some rice cakes, something like that. If you feel like, hey, I really need carbs to work out well. I don't feel like I have energy without them. Some people feel that way. You're better off to have them during than right before or right after. Very interesting, relatively newer stuff that's coming out. This next one gets me excited. So simple, lemon water or apple cider vinegar or both. This is fascinating. Take a look at this research. It was published in the European Journal of Clinical Nutrition. They took a look at subjects that consumed equal amounts of bread, three groups, equal amounts of bread. One group consumed bread with 250 milliliters of water. The other group, bread with 250 milliliters of tea. And finally, bread with 250 milliliters of lemon water, or lemon juice. The group that had the lemon water ended up having a mean glucose level that was 30% lower than the others, than the water. The tea didn't really have any change. 30% lower by having lemon, okay? And subsequent insulin response was lower as well. And it delayed the spike by 35 minutes. So basically 30% decrease in the overall spike and it was delayed and stretched out, it took 35 minutes longer to get to that peak. So it was much more stable. That is fascinating. And the reason why this is potentially happening is because of our salivary amylase. When we have acid that comes in from lemon juice or vinegar, it sort of disrupts how much salivary acid we produce. Therefore, slowing down the digestion or slowing down just the, yeah, the digestion of those carbohydrates so they don't absorb as quickly into the bloodstream. You're not getting rid of the glucose spike, you're just lessening it and stretching it out. It's a very honest, realistic thing. The last thing is something very interesting. Astaxanthin. What the heck does that mean? Okay, astaxanthin is a red pigment that is found in algae, it's found in shrimp, it's found in salmon. And I'm not saying you make an algae shrimp salmon omelet, but I am saying I don't like to push supplements a whole lot. So if you go the supplement route, you can certainly take astaxanthin, okay? About eight milligrams is a good amount. I'll talk about that in a second. Or if you like things like smoked salmon, like lox, get some smoked salmon and cook it up into your eggs because the salmon has that red pigment, which is astaxanthin. The Asia Pacific Journal of Clinical Nutrition published a paper looking at 44 people with type two diabetes. With these people, they gave them eight milligrams of astaxanthin for eight 
weeks. And then they found that it improved their blood sugar response quite significantly. So we have to ask the question, what is the mechanism here? Well, when you start looking at other research, you see that, well, astaxanthin is an antioxidant, and it seems to have a potential protective effect on the pancreatic beta cells, especially when it comes down to high glucose and overfeeding. So when we overfeed ourselves, it is a stressor, okay? And we need oxidative uh, protection there. We need antioxidants to protect us from the oxidative stressors. So when this happens, and you have this situation occurring from overfeeding and overcarbohydrate consumption, well, astaxanthin potentially mitigates the damage that could be instilled upon the pancreatic beta cells, protecting them so that they can still function somewhat normally. Now, this is all a little bit convoluted and it's not 100% concrete, but it's an interesting thing because if you add smoked salmon, you're getting omega-3s anyway, you're getting healthy fats, you're getting protein, and you're potentially getting astaxanthin that could potentially help you. So it sounds like a win-win-win across the board to me. So all these things are so simple and can be implemented tomorrow, like no big deal, first thing in the morning. Use that link down below, check out those flax pancakes. It will change how your family eats. Trust me, it is a game changer for the family and for you. So check them out down below and I'll see you tomorrow.